The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So I, I understand that uh, in the session that you just had, you went through the deworming case. Um, and I was just talking to some people on the break, and uh, they were saying that it's, everything's been very focused on methods, uh, which is understandable. That's what the purpose of the course is. But uh, it sounded like there was people were interested in hearing a little bit about the, the substantive results. So I, I just thought before I launched into this lecture, I'd say a little bit about that. Um, and maybe this is also a way to give you a little bit of background on where I'm coming from. Um, so I had, um, I taught secondary school in Kenya right after college, and then, uh, then went to grad school, and then, um, then you know, I went back after, after graduating from getting my PhD and getting a real job and having some money, I eventually went back to, um, to visit some friends, and one of them was working for an NGO, which was just, uh, just starting work in Western Kenya. And he, he, his job was to find some schools, seven schools to start a program in. And I said to him, not really thinking this was, uh, you know, something that he would do, but you know, why don't you pick twice as many and you know, choose the seven, choose the seven randomly, at least where you're going to start. And much to my surprise, he he was interested, and then he went to his boss, and his boss actually did it. So um, so that's in part how the sort of you know wave of uh, of random, you know, random, uh, randomized evaluations with NGOs got, got going. Um, but we, we then, this NGO worked a lot in education. And over the years, we tried a, a number of things to try to uh, get more kids in school and stop kids from dropping out. But eventually, they tried, um, they tried uh, treating kids for worms. And part of this was you know, based on reading the literature, which suggested that this is an important health intervention. It was a question, would it have education effects? So it turned out of all the various things that we looked at, you know, we calculated what was the cost per additional year of uh, schooling generated. So we're comparing a bunch of things in that same environment in Western Kenya. And you know, deworming came out you know, an order of magnitude better than anything else. So this, was a, you know, this is a really striking result. It, 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 if you spent $3.50, you could generate an additional year of education for a child, which is just much cheaper than any of the other alternatives. So we had that academic result. Then we, we went, the, there were people at the World Bank who were very interested in this. There sort of very, a lot of heterogeneity in the bank, but a lot of people there who are very interested in and un understand evidence and are interested in and are responsive to it. And the particular uh, people who are working on the health and education sector in the bank in Kenya, uh, that, that very much applies to. So they then took it to the, uh, to the Ministry of, of Education and brought us in to talk to the people in the Ministry of Education. Um, and you know, there's a, uh, no, this, took, this process took quite a lot of time. I don't want to underestimate this. It took a lot of time. You know, the first time they said, you know, these results are interesting and yes, we should pursue them, but you know, there's a lot going on inside the Ministry of Education, lots of other priorities. There's teacher strikes, there's, there's all sorts of things that have to take, uh, take higher priority. But as we, as, you know, we both externally outside uh, um, in, in sort of international foreign academic fora and in, internally inside Kenya, you know, we kept uh, bringing this up. And you know, eventually the permanent secretary, who's, who's you know, very strong, uh, the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Education said, you know, let's do this. And he brought in uh, various people um, and they, you know, they decided they were going to try to implement this on a, on a have a national scale up of this. Um, and there was, you know, there was both the there was both that, that internal uh, persuasion of people within the Ministry of Education, but then of course there's a question of getting budget for it. Obviously the, the, having the World Bank uh, on side you know, helped on that. The other thing that we did was, um, so Esther and I were both involved in a, uh, something, something that uh, event the World Economic Forum put on uh, in Davos. And we, working with that group, we were able to arrange for there to be an event in, in Davos for on, on this issue of deworming, and we started, a, we helped start an organization called uh, called Deworm the World, which was designed to promote this. 
And uh, we invited the Prime Minister of Kenya to come speak, and he made this announcement. And I think that helped drive this, drive this forward a lot, because once you get a, a public announcement by a politician, <laughs> that can really, you know, that can really, then it's really going to happen in a way. Um, so between the, the support internally within the, within the ministry and this higher level political support, um, Kenya is just, just as we speak, just in the past few months, uh, dewormed almost three million children. So this is an example of you know, how if you can identify a successful intervention, it can really help promote scale up of the successful interventions, which is really, you know, ultimately that's the, the purpose of what we're doing is trying to improve policy. So I just wanted to you know, sort of give you that <laughs> tie into reality before plunging back into econometrics. Uh, um, are there any, I mean, anybody, do, any comments or questions on that? Uh, yeah. I mm -hmm. thought this was really interesting. Um, could you just give us a couple of the year points in that? You talked about things yeah. taking a long time. You sure. Time uh, so the, well, the, so the, our article appeared, and publishing the article takes a long time, too. <laughs> our article appeared in 2004, I believe. Um, and the, the um, you know, it's now 2009, and this is, this is happening now. So this is not, you know, I'm sure there are cases where the NGO responded much more quickly, uh, although uh, eventually they changed their strategy as well. So the NGO scaled up, but to get the national government to scale up, you know, that took a, I think that took a constellation of various people. It took, it took some time for this to, you know, get in the media, to get in the academic world, to get out to the, 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 the media, to get to opinion, uh, uh, opinion leaders, uh, both you know, sort of internationally, um, and then and then, um, then it took time for the, you know, the, the right set of people to be available and the money to be available uh, to do it. Yes? Just kind of following up on that, this is an issue that you know, mm -hmm. is obviously quite concerning, the, the bridge between academia and the policy mm -hmm. world and, and the fact that this research is absolutely fabulous, but then at the end of the day, it stays in a you know, textbook and what uses it to um, beneficiaries. So what sort of, I mean, this kind of example is, again, fabulous, but what sort of actions or roles are there to extend findings into the policy world and into the development world? Um, I'm just kind of, I'm sure that's a big topic, but just right. very briefly, like, is j -Pal or sister organizations doing that sort of extension? Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, I think one, you know, there, there is a question of what's the, you know, in this particular case, you know, there was a, I would say that, um, you know, I spent a fair amount of time afterwards trying to disseminate this, um, and you know, J-PAL has been very important in starting Deworm the World, um, and that effort. You know, I think this this requires sort of effort at a at a variety of levels. I mean, both at trying to get the prime minister on board, but also in trying to you know do tasks like well, you need a spreadsheet of where all the schools in the country and where and which ones of them are in areas where we think that there's there's worms um, and working out a bunch of logistics of well how many trainers do you need and so on now i think in different settings there'll be the you know, in this one um I, uh people who are at, at jpal and ipa uh have been involved in even down to that spreadsheet level um the you know that may not that may not that may not be the case all the time. I think it depends a lot on the particular government. I think, obviously, J-PAL is primarily an academic organization, and so it's 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 you know it's not the right organization to manage the actual rollout. Um, but where you draw the line is a you know it's a it's a difficult question. But I also yes. Yeah. Oh, no, no, go ahead. So it seems like the deworming medication is really cheap and it's mm -hmm. very easy. To yeah, um, there's so there are, there are other things that could be done in the school health uh, area, I and mean, perhaps with micronutrients, etc. But I, I haven't yet done. I, I don't want to go too far there, both because I want to get back to the econometrics, and because uh, um, I, you know my, I, I know more about worms than I do other things. But I think there are other there are micronutrients and other things that could be delivered that way. And there's some work that's been done on. Uh, presumptive treatment for malaria um, that, that is very intriguing and, and suggests that might work. There's also things you can do in education, you know, HIV, AIDS education and so on, Pascaline DuPost and some, Esther and, uh, Pascaline DuPost does some very nice work on that and then Esther and Pascaline and Samuel Sine and I have some, some joint work on that as well. 
Okay, well, let me, um, let me turn to, uh, to the topic of this lecture, which is, and I'm happy, if there's time at the end I'm, or in the break, I'm happy to, to follow up on these issues, um, which is um, managing threats to evaluation and, and to data analysis. So, I think in the previous discussion, there, like, there's been things about you know, how do you set up your sample size, how do you actually randomize, and that's, you know, those, doing those things is, is obviously critical, but it might not be sufficient because there can still be problems in, with uh, impact measurement and, and analysis. And I'll, I'll, some of those you can try to minimize ahead of time. And I'll talk, I'm going to focus mostly on what can be done ahead of time. And then Sean's going to talk about what can be done in the analysis stage uh, to try and deal with problems that, that did come up and what, what inferences you can make and what inferences you can't make. Um, so let me, um, let me actually, I'm going to do a small uh, semi-randomized trial here, uh, quasi-randomized trial, I guess I should say. Um, I'm going to consider a program which is giving people money as a social anti-poverty program, okay? And uh, so if we, if, I think rather than do full randomization. We can, you can actually leave that down for a while. I, I'm, I'll come back to the evaluation of this program later. I'm, now I'm going to do the randomization and the implementation and we can, we can do the... Uh, too late. Okay, too late? Okay, it's fine. Um, so I guess, could you, maybe people could, we could count off people one, two, one, two, and then just give all the ones uh, 500 bucks and the twos, nothing. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> You shouldn't feel too bad if you're in the control group. Okay. Um, Can I cash the money? You've got the money now, yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah there'll be opportunities later on. Um, okay. Um, Okay, so, so the, here, are the, here are the problems I want to discuss. Uh, the first one is, so hang on to this money, and I'll come back, uh, we'll, we'll deal with it later on. Uh, first one is attrition. Um, and second is, is externalities. Um, and the third one is partial compliance. Uh, so you have a so the, the first one is attrition. Some people, you're not able to get collect follow-up data on. You, you, you try, but you're not able to. The second one, externalities, what happens if your program, as in the case of deworming, winds up affecting the comparison group as well as the treatment group? Um, and the third one is partial compliance. You want to implement in certain places, but some places they, they don't actually implement it. Some, maybe some of your comparison group accidentally gets treated. Yeah. What do you do in that case? Okay. Um, all of these things are really about internal validity. <coughs> so there's important questions of external validity and interpretation, and, and Sean's going to talk some about those, but I'm going to just focus on the internal validity of these. Okay. Um, so you know, the, the first question with the attrition is, you know, is it going to be a problem if some of the people you know, disappear before you can collect the data? Okay. And uh, you know, this can be a this can be a, a real problem. In, in Kenya, for example, um, kids often change their name. So it's just a part of the culture. You change your name at some point. That's going to make it difficult to find everybody afterwards. Um, so okay. So uh, a first question. Oh, gosh. I thought this was going to come up bit by bit. Uh, <laughs> well, OK, we've got the whole slide. So, uh, so uh, is it a problem the type of people who, who if the type of person who disappears is, uh, is correlated with the treatment? Um, and um, does anybody want to answer that, even though the, uh, you know, <laughs> there's some answer there? Uh, what, uh, you know, this, this is not, um, yeah, this has the name of it, but it's not saying what the, what the issue is. Does anybody want to comment on that? 
Yes. So if the, um, if the attrition is correlated with treatment, mm -hmm. then you're going to end up with uh, underestimated or overestimated effect depending on what the correlation is. Okay. Um, can, uh, that's great. Can you say more about, about that? Um, so if there, um, if the correlation is that the people who disappear um, are people who um, didn't get the treatment who most needed, who most needed the treatment, um, then what you're left with in the control group mm -hmm. is the people, um, the stronger people, the people who mm -hmm. maybe didn't need the treatment as much or maybe had other reasons that they were, they were doing just fine. And so it's going to look like the effect is, um, the, the treatment effect is less mm -hmm. because you have a strong control group compared to a um, randomized treatment group. Right, okay, so that's great. So let's, let's, let's go through an example where we can see that sort of thing, uh, thing you know, potentially see that sort of thing happening. Okay. So um, let's think about a problem where there's, um, there's some kids who, who, uh, who don't come to school because they're too weak, they're undernourished. So imagine that's the context. Um, and imagine you, you start a school feeding program and you want to do an evaluation of the impact of of this on school attendance. So this, in fact, you know, was something we wanted to do. Um, you're, and imagine you're interested both in the impact on enrollment, but also on, the, on children's nutrition, their, which you measure by their weight. Okay? Um, and imagine that, in, in the, that the real effect of this program is that the weak, the stunted children actually go to school more if they're near a treatment school. Okay? So if you go to all the schools and you measure everyone who's in school on a given day, are you going to, in that case, are you going to see the treatment control difference in weight overstated or, or understated? Overstated. Overstated. So what's the story for why it would be overstated? Because in the, in the, in the treatment schools, a lot, of ki a lot of kids who really need the nutrition would start going in. Whereas in the control group, they have no incentive to go, so they are, they are not being included. In oh, that's that. interesting. That's interesting. Okay, okay. So, uh, so my intuition, in fact, the example is going to be the opposite. But I think it's true. You could tell a story where this could go either way. Um, and you just told a story where it would, where it would go that way. Um, so so let, me, let me show you the... Um, let me, show you, let me show you a hypothetical numerical example. And if you can actually work through this, that, that, would, be, that would be useful. So imagine that, let's take, imagine there's just three kids in each of these communities. Okay? Um, so um, imagine that before treatment, there, the distribution looked identical. So there was one kid who weighed 30 kilos, another at 35, another at 40. Okay? Um, and after treatment, let's say it's a successful program, and it gets everybody up by two pounds. Okay? So everybody, or two, I guess we should do this in pounds, given these numbers. So it gets everybody up by two pounds. Um, in the comparison group, everybody stays the same. Okay? So when you calculate what the, the average, you know, the average, the average here is going to be 35, um, and here it's going to be 35, so there's going to be no difference at, at baseline. If you look afterwards, if you somehow, if you didn't have any attrition and you managed to follow all these kids, you would, f you would, you'd correctly measure the impact of this program. You'd say that it's, it's added two pounds to people's weight. Okay? Now here's one possible pattern of attrition. Suppose you go on a given day, but not all of the kids are, are there that day. So um, in particular, imagine that the, imagine that the, the weaker kids, the, uh, are less likely to be there. Okay? Um, so suppose only children who are more than 30 kilograms come to school. Okay? So in that particular, imagine the kids who are, who are um, less than 30 kilograms are only there half the time or something. And you happen to show up on a day when kids who are, le who are only over 30 kilograms come to school. Well then, the person who is still at 30 kilograms in the comparison group isn't going to be there at all. You'll measure the average here at 37 and a half. Here, um, so, um, so you'll see no difference beforehand. Afterwards, when it, can you compute what, what, what you're going to estimate the impact of the treatment to be? Yeah. 
negative half a pound, right? So you'll, uh, you'll, you'll conclude, in this case, for this particular set of assumptions, you'll underestimate the impact, okay? Um, but there's nothing, it's not necessarily the case that attrition differences between the groups always lead to underestimates. So, you know, you, you, it can be the opposite. So we happen to pick a case here where it worked this way. But here's, an, here's another example, okay? So suppose the treatment is a, let's put that other context behind us. Think about a different context. Think about the context of a, of a, we're just trying to improve learning. And we've got a new math course, and it's a hard course, okay? Um, imagine that this is, you know, quite, so for example, in, in, a, in the state of Massachusetts, they've imposed something called the, uh, there are now graduation requirements. It used to be that it was very easy to graduate from secondary school. They put in requirements to make this much tougher. You have to pass an exam, okay? And, the proponents of this argue, well, it's a good thing because it forces the kids to study more, it forces the teachers to really prepare them, and they're probably right. The opponents argue that, well, the kids who figure they're not going to be able to pass just drop out. They may be right as well, okay? So if you're trying to evaluate the impact of this program, and imagine that we randomized across states in the U.S. and some states implemented and some didn't, you know, if you just looked at those kids, if you looked at the average score among those who, who got through, well, you might see it's better in the, in the, in the treatment group, okay? Um, but would, what would, you know, would that be the right conclusion about the impact of the program? It might, might not be. So let me keep going with this. So, so we've got this harder course. Imagine those who can't handle it drop out. You give the same math <coughs> test in the treatment and control schools, but you only have data on those who didn't drop out, okay? Because you go to the school and you get everybody who's there in the school, okay? So what's the direction the bias going to be in that case? Yeah, exactly, exactly. In the treatment group, you'll only see the strong students. In the comparison group, you'll have the, have the mix, okay? Um, so, um, so in this, so that's, that's an example uh, uh, of the case that you were talking about, okay? So what, in the, in the deworming program with testing, what was the natural concern with attrition bias there? Yeah. Most schools, the most worms were going to be. Exactly. You, you get them to stay, you know, the kid's pretty weak because they've had lots of worms. You cut off the worms, they, they come to school, but you've got, so the treatment group would then be adding in these kids who are, who are weaker in some way. Uh, so that would be the concern. You know, how do you deal with it? Well, you know, one way is you can try to, to, to follow everybody up. Um, and, you know, th this is sort of the, the, the first thing you should do. Um, is the brute force approach, which is to try and follow everybody up. And that means if you have to, you know, if it's a school program, maybe you don't just test the kids in the school. You actually, the ones who dropped out, you try and find them and test them anyway. Now, that's expensive, and, and it's very difficult to find people, and it may be difficult to get them to take the exam. But if you think that the program is going to seriously affect dropout rates, then that, that can be a very important thing to do. Okay. Um, and to do that, you have to pick a sample of those who are going to be tested before the treatment, and you have to follow those people. So if you hadn't done a baseline, then this is going to be especially hard, because you don't even know who dropped out. They might not, they might not have records of those kids. So getting a, you know, there's a quest, there's sometimes questions, should you do a baseline or should you not? In theory, you could do a randomized evaluation without a baseline. But there's a lot of reasons why it's very use. Almost always, it's much better to have a baseline, and this is one of them. Which is, if you have have differential dropout, you if if the program might affect dropout, you want to have a you want to measure the effect of the program by looking at the people who are initially in the program. Okay. okay. So then, imagine that you do that, but. The truth is, it's just hard to find all these kids who dropped out. Some of them have moved, or they're not home, or whatever. Or, or they don't want to come take the test. So, imagine that you've done this, and you know, the treatment group has 20% attrition, the comparison group has 20% attrition. Are you then okay? Okay, I'm, I'm seeing the answer, uh, I, I know. So what's, uh, does anybody want to say what, what, the, what the potential problem might be? Yeah. Well, if it's not random as to who drops out, mm -hmm. then you're still going to have different facts. If there's still a correlation between who's dropping out in the control group versus who's dropping out in the treatment group, mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. still going to affect the outcomes. Yeah, um, that's exactly right. And I'm wondering, I'm wonder, I'm trying to think of this myself. Can can anybody come up with a a, like a, a hypothetical but concrete uh, example where 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 you could have the same attrition rate in the two groups, but you, your your estimate would still be messed up? 
or biased to use the technical term. Yeah. <laughs> For example, if the, the treatment group is only the case with high low who drop off and in the control group it's those with low Exactly, exactly. So, so if, you, if in each case you lose 20%, but in the treatment group um, you're, you're losing the, the top 20%, and the comparison group you're losing the bottom 20%, then you're really going to, and you only measure those who remain, you're going to be biased. Um, and so I'm guessing, you know, um, imagine, well, so here's an example of something that could do that. Imagine that, that, um, imagine that you switch to a you put in a remedial education program. Okay? That might mean maybe the kids at the top now think, oh, I don't want to, it's a very, you're, you sort of, imagine you lower the level of, of the curriculum. Well, then maybe the kids in the, in the, uh, in the treatment group, maybe the, the kids who are at the top of the distribution say, um, I don't want to be in the school, I'm switching to another school because they don't want the, the lower level curriculum. So you lose 20%. In the, comparis in the comparison school, the 20 the 20 percent at the top don't drop out but the 20 percent at the bottom drop out because they didn't have this uh, this uh, special attention so in each case you've got 20 percent attrition but the estimate of the impact of the program is going to be going to be very seriously biased okay so how can you deal with that well what you should do is you should check whether you have a imagine you had pretest scores for the kids well then you could see can we know what's the predictors of, of dropout in the treatment group and in the comparison group? And ideally, you'd find the predictors are the same. And then you're somewhat reassured. You're not completely, completely safe because maybe, maybe your initial test scores aren't really a good measure of, of their true uh, potential uh, eventual test score. But it, it helps a lot. Okay. The other thing you can do is you can try to bound the extent of the bias. So we go through an exercise of, um, like this in the deworming paper. So suppose everyone who dropped out of the treatment got the lowest test score that you, you got. So what, what you can do is you can say, we're going to put those people for whom we don't have outcome data, we're going to create an artificial data set where we put them back in the data, but we artificially assign them the lowest conceivable score. And then su suppose everybody who dropped out of the control group uh, got the highest score that anybody could get. Okay, so if you, if you artificially give everybody who dropped out of treatment the lowest possible score, and you artificially give everybody who, get, who, who dropped out of the control group the highest possible score, well then you've sort of created the, you're sort of bending over backwards to say, how bad could the program potentially have been? And if you do this exercise, and you find that even when you do this, it looks like the pro program is good, then you can be pretty confident the program is good. So this is what's called constructing a lower bound. And similarly, you can construct an upper bound on, on how well the program did. Okay. Um, and if you have a high dropout rate, you know, your, your lower bound and your upper bound are going to be very far apart from each other. You're not going to be able to, 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 to say that much about what, what the impact of the program is. But if you have a low dropout rate, and, uh, then it may not be so much of a, then this might, it might be that your bounds are very close together. And cheaper. It's cheaper than, than finding everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, I think a lot depends on the particular context, whether this, um, you know, if you, there, and there's also various bounds you can do. So I'm, I'm not going to, let me not go into the full detail on that, but you can make, you can have bounds that are sort of very conservative, and this would be an example of them, where you're assuming that, that um, where, you're, where you sort of construct the, the worst case scenario would be, you know, this is very much a worst case scenario. You can imagine other scenarios that are not the very worst case, case scenario, but are, are, uh, um, are pretty bad case scenarios, and say even in that case, uh, you know, the program would have worked. Okay, okay. so, um, okay, so that's, so let me, before I, the next topic is going to be externalities, uh, but before I go on to that, uh, do people have questions on attrition or comments on it, or, or questions about, you know, this in practice? Okay, let me move on to externalities. So first I want to create some externalities. Um, so everybody who got some money, I heard a suggestion that, you know, of sharing some money, so why don't we implement that? So why don't you turn to your neighbor and, you know, why don't you share some of the money uh, with your neighbor? I'll, I'll, let you, uh, I'll let you decide how generous you want to be. <laughs> it is fake money after all. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Um, do whatever you like. Do whatever you like. Okay. And um, you know, by the way, what what just you know what you guys just did, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of people theories of development. I don't know whether this is practice or not, which would say that that sort of thing might happen about a lot of theories about risk sharing within communities and, and so on. Maybe that's all propaganda, I don't know. But anyway, some people would claim that that sort of thing could happen. So, um, so, so now I, what I want to talk about though is you know, what's the impact on our program evaluation. Um, so let's, what I'd like to do is to do a, to do a, a a program evaluation now of what's the what was the impact of this program where I just gave you know, you're all a village I gave half the people in the village 500 bucks so how do we do that well we randomize the program and uh, pseudo randomize the program reasonably close cutting off one two what's the you know what's the um, what's the impact of the program well let's figure out what our how much money our treatment group people have and our comparison group people have so if you can look in your wallet figure out how much money you have there, add in the fake money, and come up with a total. And then we'll try and do some, some why don't we I'll do some data collection. So let me put this up here. Yeah, add in your actual money and your fake money and, uh, and we'll see. Okay, um, so. So you're, are you a treatment group person? Yes. Okay. Um, so how much money do you have, including everything? 784. 784. Okay. Hope there's no thieves around here that I'm you know, revealing things to. Um, 784. Including this. Your control group? Okay. 300. Okay. 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 Um, the only money you have is what I gave you. What's on your, your trial card or whatever? Uh, so how much do you have? Uh, 407. 407, your treatment, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I got $14 and $1 on my child card. Okay, so $15 we'll call. Okay. Okay. 550. 550, okay. okay. Maybe we should, maybe the second row should just come up and, uh, and, and write, uh, write on here. Sorry? 140. 140, okay. 428. Okay. 318. 318. Okay. Uh, 698. Six, I'll put this here. Okay. 263. And are you a one or a two? 500. I don't know. Oh, oh, so you're, you're group one. And sorry, what was the number again? 263. 263. Okay. Oh, you're a very generous guy. Uh, at least with fake money, right? 270, oh, 270. Okay, so this one looks like the program was uh, counterproductive in, the, in, in your case. We had a negative seven effect on, on income, okay. 227. 227, okay. Okay. 500. 500, okay. You know what, uh, we could go and do the full sample, but maybe we should, maybe we should, well, I'll, I'll, we'll take two more, okay. 700. 700, I'm sorry, you, which group are you? 700, okay. And I have 200. 200, oh, so that, that got the, uh, okay. So why don't we get the, um, uh, is anybody, so let's try and figure out what, let's, we'll just take a partial sample rather than keep going. Let's try and get the, the average in the treatment group and the average in the comparison group. So average in the treatment group is 507, 508. 508, okay. And the average in the group is 249. 249, okay. Okay, so, so now we do our evaluation and we go through and we say, okay, 
We gave out $500 to people. Now we've gone back to see how they're doing, compare them to the comparison group, and it looks like you know this program is is $250, they're $259 richer. So you know, did the program work? Well, the program worked, but was it cost effective? Not really, because we you know we gave them $500. They've only, they're only $250 approximately richer. This really wasn't a, wasn't a big success. Okay. Um, so, well, go ahead. That's only one way of looking at it, right? Exactly. That's one way of looking at it. If you, if you, if you came with that conclusion, you know, you'd be missing a really important dimension of what the impact of the program is. Certainly, if you're, if you're a policymaker who's mostly concerned about what's the impact on the community, not what's the impact on the particular individual I gave it to, then you would, you'd basically have a very misleading answer. So that's a danger, you know, I mean, this, the topic of this, uh, this, uh, this lecture is, you know, what are threats? Um, and this is a threat, that you sort of, you misunderstand the impact of the program because you haven't adequately count, accounted for the externality. Okay. Now, this is a, um, you know, so, so there's a, that's the problem. Let me now talk about, you know, what can you do about that problem? Okay. Um, so let me, let me look at this in the context of deworming, then maybe we can come back to this, uh, this example again. So in the case of, uh, of deworming, a lot of the earlier work randomized deworming treatment within schools. So the problem is that when you're dewormed, that may interfere with the transmission of the disease. If, you don't have, if the treatment kills the worms in your body, that means the worms are no longer laying eggs, they're no longer being spread in the community as much. So what, you know, what's the problem that's going to create for the evaluation? You're going to see benefits in the control group. Right, you can see benefits in the control group, just as, the, as this cash example. Okay, so now those, if those, you know, there's a, in that, this particular case, um, you know, we argue that those benefits might not just have affected the kids who go to that school, but might have also affected neighboring schools as well. But let's start out with the analytically simpler case. Suppose the benefits are local. So suppose you only share money with your neighbors, but you don't share money with, you know, people in another classroom and engineering or something like that. So, how you know how could you measure and and how can you measure the total impact the the impact on the community as a whole of the program? Um, you know what what could you do in that case? Yeah. You could phase in and uh, at different uh, at different rates to try and evaluate well, what would be the uh, impact of just having a peer control peer treatment and then try and figure out from a phase in what the impact of uh, you know, the externality would be. So, that, so, so, so you could phase it in, and you'd have to, in this case, if the externalities were, were local within a school or within a classroom, in the case of this money example, you could phase it in at the level of, a, of schools, right, or of classrooms, and say we're going to do 20% of the people in that classroom, 40% of the people in this classroom, 60% of the people in that classroom. Right. Now what's the, by the way, before I go further with this, what's the, so there's an advantage of this, well, let me come back to this. There's an, I'm going to discuss the advantage of this, but there's also a disadvantage. Okay? So, so let's, let's take this case where, um, where there's externalities within a school. Um, the, so you know, if, we, if we think about this you know, particular case, so imagine that, um, that we, there's no externalities. Pupil one is treated, and the outcome is they don't have worms. Pupil two is not treated, but they still don't have worms, right? Some people just don't get the worms. Pupil three is treated, um, they don't have worms because the medicine worked. Pupil four is not treated, and they do have worms. Pupil five is treated, and they don't have worms. Pupil six isn't treated, and they do have worms. So what's going to be the, what's going to be the estimate? So in this case, where there's no externalities going on, what's going to be the estimate of the of the treatment effect here? So, somebody, you said 100%? Uh, what, do you want to go through the, the reasoning you're thinking of on that? So, well, let's, maybe it's, let's try and fill in these. So, it's true that everybody, nobody who is treated has worms because the medicine works. Um, so, it would be a, um, so the, the, total, the total people in worms in the treatment group uh, uh, with worms is going to be zero. 
So in that sense, it's 100, you've eliminated 100% of the group that does have worms. How many in the, in the control group are going to have worms? Three, okay. So it depends how you, um, how you define, this is a big distinction that, uh, that people, uh, it's sort of tedious, but it's important to make when you write things up is percentage effect versus percentage point effect. Um, so percentage point is the sort of absolute value. Um, so let me first do the, the, the percentage point and then come back to the percent. Um, so we've got, uh, let's see, we have zero people having in the treatment group. The total in the control with worms, was that three, if I remember right? Okay, so 50% of people have it in the control group, zero have it in the comparison group. So it's a 50 percentage point difference. I mean, the difference between 50 percentage points and zero percentage points. So one way, accurate way to write this up would be say we had a 50 percentage point difference. Another way would be to say we eliminated 100% of the initial level, okay? They're both accurate, it's just um, uh, different ways of expressing it. But when you, when you write things up, just I, the convention is to use percentage point for the absolute value. Okay? So the treatment effect would be 50 percentage points or, or 100 percent. Okay? But now suppose, that, suppose that, um, that you actually do have externalities. So some children are not reinfected with worms. Okay? So um, these worms have a life cycle. So eventually the worms and you die, you have a high worm load because you're continually being reinfected. So th think about this example where some of the kids in the comparison group don't get reinfected. Okay, so what would be the, let's just think about the percentage point effect for comparison. What are you going to estimate the impact being in this case? So the, so, so, um, okay, so, wait, did I just see this thing? Okay, let me just uh, do the, I'm sorry, did we, we didn't, yeah. oh, oh, I think with this, this uh, earlier thing, I, the, the, uh, we didn't do the count, did we do the counting right in that well, one? Well, you, you said there was 50% um, yeah, control I, I, with worms, and unless I'm misunderstanding, it looks like it's 100%. Right? Yeah, the, that's right. I, I cited, I, somebody had said 50, and I just, I didn't look. I just sort of assumed that was the right number. Let me just look at the nose. Nose are, yes, that's right. It's a, I'm sorry. It's 100% who have, have worms. Sorry, that was uh, very confusing. Um, so, so now I see why you said it. it's 100% either way, whether it's percentage points or percent, uh, you, would have, you would have reached that same conclusion. Okay, so, so all of the people, 100% in the, so let me just go back here just to repeat in case it wasn't clear to others like it wasn't clear to me. Um, so if the total in the treatment with worms is 100% is in this example, total in the control with worms is, is zero. Um, yeah, I think I read, I must have got confused on reading it in, horizontal lines there. Okay, so in this case, um, the total in the treatment group with, uh, with worms is, we still have no, zero in the treatment group with worms, and in the comparison group, we've got 67%, 67%. So we're gonna, we're gonna say, so here's the, so we're gonna estimate the treatment effect in this case being 67%. Now notice that this, The difference, yeah, the difference between 167. So you, you, uh, um, so sorry, the hundred and uh, let's see if we got this. It's the hundred. Okay, this is you're right. This is zero, and this is 67. So we'd estimate a 67 percent effect. Okay, so the um, so the the um, so the thing to take away from this is that uh, if there were no externalities, we would estimate. We would have estimated this correctly at 100 percent. There are the effect of the program. Now we do. Now we say, suppose there are externalities to this. So now that makes the program actually better, right? Because more people are being cured of worms through this this program. But we're going to estimate the effect of the program is actually lower. Instead of estimating the 100 percent benefit, we'll, we'll estimate only a 67 percent benefit. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, so if you are, so, so how do you deal with that? Well, 
if you design the unit of the randomization so it encompasses all those spillovers, then you're, gonna, then you're going to, that's one way to address this problem. Okay, so if you expect that all the externalities are within school, you can just randomize at the level of the school. Okay. So here's, a, here's another approach. Um, and this is you know, the, the actual data from the program. The percentage of children with a moderate or heavy infection in the treatment schools was 27%. It was 52% in the comparison schools. So the program reduced moderate to heavy infections by 25%. Okay. This medicine probably treat, affected more kids initially, but if you go back and measure a year later, uh, some of them have been, been reinfected. Okay. You also got a reduction in the number of kids who are sick and, and who are anemic. Okay. This is comparing the, the whole, you know, one school to another school. Okay. Um, so we will have accounted for the total impact of the program within schools, if there's, if there's within school spillovers. Um, okay. Now, there's evidence that, in fact, we, we want to, you know, suppose that you wanted to actually measure the spillovers. Suppose you are interested in the spillovers themselves and not just the total impact. And you might well be. Can you imagine you're interested in the question of, how much do we need, do we really need to incentivize people to take this? Or could we charge them for the medicine? Well, if you thought that everybody benefited from the medicine pretty much equally, whether you took it or not, because most of the impact was on the transmission of the disease, then you might need to, you might need to subsidize it more. You might want to subsidize it more than if you thought the individual got all the benefit. So if you actually want to measure the spillovers, here's what we did in the, you know, one of the things we did in the, in the school, uh, in the, the paper on deworming. So, at the time, this is no longer the case, I want to emphasize, but at the time there was concern that the, the sort of official guidelines were not to treat girls over 12 unless you knew they had worms. They shouldn't be treated sort of presumptively in case the medicine caused birth defects and in case the girls were, were pregnant. Turns out that they've now given this widely enough that WHO guidance is, there's no evidence it causes birth defects and you can give it to everybody. But at the time, uh, they weren't giving it to, uh, to girls above 12. So imagine you looked, you compared girls above 12 in the treatment schools to girls above 12 in the comparison schools. Okay. Um, if you do that, and if you look at, there are some other things we can do. Uh, so there are some other sources of who wasn't treated. This, is, this comparison I'm going to show you is a little bit more than that. But you can compare the treated students in treatment schools to the comparable students in the comparison schools. So kids who, are, um, who looked comparable on, on a variety of observable dimensions, or who wound up taking the, this when, when, they became, when they became eligible to take it. We saw a very big gap in, uh, in prevalence among those two groups. So this is much more of a straight treatment comparison uh, um, look. Okay. Here we're looking at the untreated students in the treatment schools and trying to find comparable students in the comparison schools. And so this is, you know, this is, n this is not, I should emphasize, this isn't quite as pure as a standard, uh, uh, you know, randomized design. These are the people who were, who later, this program was phased in over time. These are the people that when their school was phased in, they wound up not getting treated. So maybe there were differences between years, but that, that's, you know, that's sort of a, uh, a caveat or a footnote. Um, but you see that even with these untreated students, so none of these guys were treated, but these people were in a school where their, where their classmates were treated. So they have much lower levels of infection than these people who are also not treated, but whose classmates were not treated. Okay. Now what happens, what if you expect externalities across, so actually before I go, before I go on to this, this uh, the set further challenge of what if there are externalities across schools. Just sticking with this question of externalities within schools, talked about one way of dealing with that was to do the randomization at the level of the school. Okay. So what's the disadvantage of doing the randomization at the level of the school? Assume, yeah. Assuming that everybody in the same school is at the same level. Um, so there's, so you could still have some differences within the school, um, but the, um, you know, there is a sense in which you're going to have, have less information if you're randomizing at the, at the level of the school. Um, 
Yes. Mm -hmm. We need more schools. So, right. So at some, you know, the, the crudest way of putting this is, you know, if there's 200 kids in a school, if there's 400 kids in a school and you have a, 100 schools and you're randomizing the level of the individual, then you've got 40,000 observations. And if you've got 200 schools you're randomizing and you're randomizing the level of the school, you've got 100, you know, 100 treatment schools and 100 comparison schools, much smaller sample size, much less power. Okay? That's, that's, that particular calculation I just did is overstating the difference. Um, um, you've talked, people have talked about clustering, you've learned about clustering standard errors before, but you know, it's, since there's a lot of variation, to come back to, to the way you were putting it, since there's a lot of random variation between schools, some schools have good headmasters, some schools have bad headmasters, et cetera, there's a, you're, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, of uh, background noise, and it's going to make it harder to, to estimate precisely the impact of the program. So this is a, um, so you really have to think about your particular context. When you're thinking about what level to randomize that, yeah, think about in your context, are you, do you think spillovers are a real issue? If you think spillovers are a real issue, then you better randomize at a higher level. But if you think, in, in this particular context, I don't need to worry about it. If this were a, a cancer drug rather than a worm drug, then you wouldn't need to worry about it. You're much better off randomizing it at the individual level. Um, there might also be, yes? Mm -hmm. But if you're worried about attrition with randomizing at a higher level, makes that less of an issue as well, because now you're looking at a higher unit. So if you lose individuals within that, it's still an issue. It's still, it would still be an issue. If you're losing, if you're, if you're ultimately, yeah, it's still an issue. Um, okay. So, um, so, so let's say that we've decided we're going to randomize, take this worm example. So we think that most of the externalities are within schools, so we're going to randomize within schools. Um, we know that there's some external, there might be some externalities across schools, because this is an environment where kids, everybody lives on their own farm, basically. So you might have two kids living next to each other, one of whom goes to one school and another goes to another school. That's, that's not that uncommon. So you could have some externalities across schools. But, you know, randomizing at the level of a, of a district would really not be very, logistically be very, very possible. You'd have no sample size left. So you know there might be some externalities across schools as well as those within them. But you've already made the decision to randomize at the level of schools. So what do you do? Well, what you can try and do is use random variation in the density of treatment nearby. So if you pick the schools randomly that were going to be treatment schools, then some treatment school and the ones that are going to be comparison schools, there'll be some comparison schools that happen to be next to, be completely surrounded by treatment schools. There'll be other comparison schools that don't have any treatment schools nearby. So you can use that to try to pick up how big the externality is. Okay, so that's what we, so we tried to do in this, um, in this paper. So here's a map. So the ones are group one schools, they've been treated. The twos are group two schools, treated in the second wave. Threes are group three schools, not treated to the third wave. Um, here's a school that's uh, in the middle of the lake, which I think is actually on an island. So these schools in Uganda are, are not really in Uganda. That's, uh, that's the, the GPS, GPS used to be intentionally degraded by the, because it, people were, thought it could be, you know, we want to use it for military. It was developed by the military, I guess. They, they didn't want foreign militaries to have it. But, um, so, um, so these are, imp you know, these are measured with some error. But, so we've got these schools. So we can see there are some schools um, that are, you know, near treatment schools. Other schools aren't near treatment schools. By the way, the treatment schools, in this example I just did here, you know, the ones shared with the twos, but you could imagine the ones might share with other ones. So there could be externalities on other treatment schools. Okay. Okay. So let's look at a, here's a group three school that's, you know, all by itself and doesn't have any neighbors who are treated. Here's a group three school that has three group one schools that are treated. Okay. So would you want to compare those to to estimate what the effect of the deworming program is? Yeah, suppose you're interested in, in estimating the impact of the spillovers, the medical spillovers of, of treatment. Could you compare those two sets of, of schools, those two schools? 
What what might drive that? What might drive that? Make that comparison invalid to, uh, if you're trying to estimate the impact of spillovers. Mm. I'm sorry. One one means a treatment score. Three means a comparison score. So uh, one's more rural. Exactly. So and and so so that's a that's a you know this one is obviously in a less densely settled population. This one. These are, turns out these are all rural, but this is obviously much more densely settled. That's why they've got all these schools around there. Um, so now, you know, in, in this particular setting, why might that be a problem? Yeah. Because that area might be inherently different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in particular, if you think about so this is a disease. I probably should have said you know, more about this at the beginning. So these worms affect um, uh, you know, one out of every three or four people in the world, and they're spread through uh, fecal oral roots, or sometimes uh, they kind of, they're spread through fecal matter. And um, so if there's, if there's, what are the odds that you're going to, to get contaminated with fecal matter? It depends how many other people are depositing fecal matter in the environment. Clearly over here, there's a lot of people nearby you who might be depositing fecal matter in the environment. Over here, there aren't so many. So you might think that this, how densely settled the population is, and we don't think of Alaska or, or you know, the middle of the desert somewhere uh, being you know, very diseased environments, and, but you think of a highly, highly concentrated place being much more, having a lot more disease. So there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's reasons to think that sparsely settled places will have different prevalence of the disease uh, than, than uh, heavily settled uh, places. Okay? So what we did f because of that, we didn't want to just look at the number of treatment schools nearby, we just talked about why that would be a problem, um, but we want to do that controlling for the total number of schools nearby. Okay, so we control for the total density in the area, total number of schools within a certain distance or pupils within a certain distance, and say What's the effect of having treatment? What's the effect of those schools being treatment schools as opposed to being comparison schools? Oops, did I skip a? Yeah. Okay. So controlling for density, um, what we find is that the infection rates are 26 percentage points lower per thousand pupils in treatment schools within three kilometers. And then if you go further out, there's there are 14 percentage points per treatment schools that are three to six kilometers away. So this is controlling for the overall density. In the area, so hopefully we're we're uh, abstracting from that particular problem. Okay. So now, suppose we want to estimate the overall effect. So let me come back to this uh, this um, this problem. You know, clearly we've we've incorrectly estimated. We estimated that only two hundred fifty dollars of benefit went through, um, but we think that the true effect should include the effect on the comparison. So if we want to get it in this previous case, we were able to estimate the, the increase in school participation in the treatment group and, in, and then also in the comparison group because through, by, through this technique that I, I just outlined. So we know in the comparison in schools, there's a 1.5 percentage point increase in school participation. There are about three, three pupils in, there are, there are more, the three pupils in, in control schools for every treated child. And in the treatment schools, there was a seven percentage point increase in school participation for all children, but you only needed to treat two thirds of the children. Um, so you can then calculate what the overall effect is of treating one child. So if you treat one child, you pick up three children in comparison schools, each of whom gets a benefit of 0 0.015 uh, additional uh, years of education. Um, then you pick up the the, uh, the, the, this is the effect on children in, in the same school, um, and you get an overall effect of 0.15 years of education. Okay? So treating a child costs uh, you know, about, about, uh, about 50 cents, and you get, um, in fact, it's probably cheaper than that when done at scale, um, but the, the impact that you're going to get is, is um, if for every three, for every seven children, you, if, you, if each child, you get an extra 0.15 years of education. If you treat seven children, you'll get about an extra year of education. So that's how you get seven times 50 cents is 350. That's how you get to this. Uh, you spend three dollars and 50 cents on deworming, and you you get an extra year of education. Okay. Um, let me 
Let me pause again here and I'll go on and discuss some issues on partial compliance and sample selection bias. I'll, I'll talk about, I'll sort of get partway through that topic and then, uh, then Sean's going to take up uh, where I l leave off. Um, but are, are there any questions on externalities before I go on? Okay. Um, So you might think if you randomize, you're going to get rid of the, you randomize where the treatment is, you're going to get rid of sample selection bias. That's not necessarily the case. So let me show an example. So where you, ran, where you randomize where you want the program to be doesn't necessarily, that's not necessarily the sole determinant of which places actually get treated. Okay. So let me talk about, uh, you know, why. So one example would be people who are assigned to the comparison group might try to move into the treatment group. Okay, so in this example, I don't think this happened, but you know, parents could try to move their children from the comparison school to the treatment school. It's at least hypothetically possible. Okay, what, are, what are other possible reasons why, why you might not get this, this, this you know, match between the initial assignment and, and where people wound up, where the people wound up treated? Yeah. Sure, exactly. So in our case, in the case of deworming, there, was a, there were some people who either didn't want to take the medication or who maybe they wanted to, but they weren't able to get the permission slip to do it. Um, so that's, that's, that's one great example. What are other possible examples? So let me, let me sort of, if you think about your concrete experience, I mean, imagine that you know, when we, I'll, I'll tell you a story from our, our experience. Um, you know, when we were, when this NGO was trying to get started and they were trying to pick the seven schools where they were going to work, they picked the schools and they had to go to the government for permission to start working. And, you know, permission was slow. And it kept, kept being slow and slow. And they didn't realize what was going on. And it turned out, eventually, that there was a politician who was upset. And the reason he was upset, and we, they didn't understand, the NGO didn't understand why the politician was upset. Because one of the schools was lucky enough, it was in his constituency, okay, um, where, where they were going to start working. Well, it turned out it was in the part of his constituency that voted for his opponent. So, uh, so you know, that sort of thing, so, so in that sort of a situation, what the, I don't remember whether it was this, so the very, I don't remember exactly the, the, what, you know, the, the, the timing of this, but what they did was they said, um, we're going to, we, they said, Fine, we can, what, what the eventual resolution of this was they started working in the, in the, in a, the other part of his constituency where his supporters uh, lived as well. So there are all types, all sorts of cases where you're going to want to randomize, but you're not going to, you may not be able to have that happen perfectly. Okay? And the, the, in this case, it wasn't a, quote, legitimate reason. But there are other cases where there'd be very legitimate reasons why, you know, maybe the need is very intense in some area, and so the, for, uh, you know, the, the NGO or the organization feels it's very important to work in that area. So you're, there may be lots of reasons why the actual, some, some people in the comparison group wind up getting treated. Okay. Um, okay. Um, but there might also, so there are cases that we, like we just heard about where individuals allocate to treatment might not get treatment. Um, and there are cases where people who are in the comparison group uh, do get treated, okay? So in the case of deworming, 78% of those assigned to receive treatment got some treatment. Um, and the main reason they weren't treated is they just happened to be absent from school on the, the day that the treatment was given. Some students in the comparison group were, tr were treated because they went out and got the treatment on their, on their own through clinics. So what do you do? Okay, so suppose this has already happened. Okay. So imagine you have data on everybody, so attrition isn't the problem, but just you know, the actual assignment to treatment, the assignment to treatment and actual treatment don't correspond. So, so you know, w first, you know, what, what's the problem if you just do a straight comparison and, and, and what might you do about it? Students who were absent, respectively, in the home and the other 
No, so the program didn't do that, okay? So what we talked about in the case of the evaluation, when you're trying to measure the test scores or the impact on attendance, you could, well, impact on attendance, obviously, you find out whether they're there or not by visiting the school. If you wanted to do test scores, you could track them home. But the way the program was implemented, those kids who weren't at school that day, when they gave out the warming, the warming pills, they just didn't get treated. I mean, maybe the program shouldn't have been run that way, but that's how it was run. Then there are reasons why maybe it, you know, why maybe it should be run that way. So, um, so. Okay. So this is this is exactly where. This is exactly where we're gonna where we're gonna go and where where I wanted to where it's where I'm gonna wind up and where uh, where Sean's gonna be be taking over. Um, let's maybe we could first talk about imagine you're interested in the impact of this program on on test scores. So so one thing you you might think would be the right thing to do um, would be to would be to just um, just look at the people who actually were treated and compare them to people who actually weren't treated. That's going to be problematic for reasons that we'll explain later. But let me take, follow up on your suggestion, which is, you know, if you're a policymaker, so there's all sorts of questions where, 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 this, where there are questions beyond this you'd be interested in, but you're, you, you raise the idea of saying, well, what's the impact of the intent to treat somebody? And that's, that is going to be the right answer to some questions. So let me start with that question, the relatively easier question, and then, uh, then we'll move on to the harder question. I'll let Sean handle the harder questions. So, so suppose, you're, suppose you're a policymaker and you're saying, look, what's the impact of putting in this, this school-based deworming program? Well, if you're interested, what's the impact of a school-based deworming program? Well, you know, in reality, it's a true thing that you want to get at that some people are not going to get it. If this is a school-based program and you hand out the pills at the school and you don't, you know, tracking kids to their houses who are absent that day, that's expensive, that's hard to implement, uh, uses too much teacher's time, you're probably not going to find that many of the kids anyway. So you wouldn't actually implement it that way. So you don't, you don't, at some level, I'm not saying, if you're a scientist, you do care. But if you're the policymaker, you might not, you might say, no, the true effect of this program is that I'm only going to be able to get 78% of the pupils because 22% 20 of the pupils aren't there. Okay? And if some kids don't want worms, don't want the medicine, sorry, if they, if they, if they don't want, maybe they do want the worms, or they, they, they don't want the worms, but they don't want the medicine either. Anyway, if some kids aren't going to take it, then those kids aren't going to take it. Okay? So if you're interested in, so you might think, well, I want, I want to measure the impact of this program in realistic conditions, and realistic conditions are that not everybody's going to be able to get it. Okay? So let's suppose, suppose that you're a policymaker. Then what you could do is you could look at what's called the intention to treat estimate, which is what's the effect of the school having the program um, or being assigned to the program. Okay? This comes up in medical trials a lot with, say, chemotherapy. So some people who start chemotherapy don't finish it because it's just too, too painful for them and it's too, or they, you know, they're not able to handle it medically. Again, do you want to measure the impact of chemotherapy on those people who manage to get all the way through? Well, not necessarily. Maybe what you're interested in is what's the effect of, of being in this group that tries it. Um, okay. So, yes? Mm -hmm. Just, um, uh, did it actually happen in 1997? So, yeah, yeah. I guess that actually helps on the, so on actually, the dates. So, actually, so it's 10 years. Almost. That's right. So, it's More 10, 10 years. years. It's 10 years before this was rolled out nationally. So, yes, I mean, some things happened before that, but this is a long delay. Yeah, so that first delay of publication uh, was, you know, took quite a while, and then there was the second delay after it. So I think, you know, unfortunately, there's often a long, long, long delay in these things. Okay, let me see where we are. Um, okay. Okay. So what you can do is you use the original assignment, and then you're winding up with what's, what's called an intention to treat estimate. Okay. Um, the, the, okay. So what intention to treat measures is what happened to the average child who was in a treated school in the population. Okay, so it's not saying what happens to the kids who actually got the medicine, it's saying what happened to the average child who's in a treated school. So that's the, the correct interpretation of that. Now is that the right number to look for? 
Well, what are what are some what are some perp you know I talked about some purposes where that might be the right number to, to look for. What would be some reasons why that might not why you might be interested in other questions other than, than, than the answer to that question of what happened to the average child in a treated school? Suppose you, uh, the, you were thinking of having a mandatory uh, deworming program in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So the impact would be, and then you want to know what would be the impact if everybody was forced to be treated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, so um, in, in this particular case, this was a program where, um, where it was designed in such a way that not everybody had to be treated. It wasn't that you can't come to school unless you show your certificate showing you've been treated. But you might well be interested in, well, what if we went a step further? And we, we said, you're not, you know, we're going to keep a supply of medicine at the school. And if you are gone that particular day, then you get it the next day. And we don't let you come back to school unless you take, take the medicine. Well, then you might be, you wouldn't be measuring the impact of that, that program. So if you want to go beyond you know, intention to treat is very good if you're interested in the narrow question of what's the impact of this exact program. But if you're trying to go beyond what's the impact of this exact program, you're trying to start to think about generalization, then, then you want to know about, then maybe you want to understand some of the underlying parameters. And in this case, the underlying parameter is what's the effect of, of, on school attendance of a kid who had worms or a particular level of worms no longer having that. Okay. Um, so, um, and then it's using that underlying parameter that you might be able to generalize. What would be the effect of everybody getting treated? What would be the effect of, of only some people getting treated? So to do that, um, there's going to be, um, Sean's going to talk a little bit about how you would do that. Let me just, um, let me just you know, if we take, um, let's do this, um, this example where we're trying to get the, uh, maybe, maybe, you know, Wondering whether to skip this example or not. I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll do it. Uh, I'll go through it. Um, in this example, if you look at the you know, people who were um, here's the intention whether they, there was an intention to treat them. So all school one, you tried to treat everybody, but only some of them got treated. In school two, the intent was not to treat that. They were assigned to the comparison group, but a few people got treated anyway. Okay, and this is the change in weight for each individual. So then if we average the change in weight, the average change in, in school one, if people want to figure that out for a second, I've got, sorry? Well, it's, so it's 1.3, right? Um, um, and the average change in school two is 0 0.9. So, um, so the, um, so the intention to treat effect would be comparing the, the 1.3 to the, to the 0 0.9. Okay. Now when is that useful? Well, as I was saying, for an actual program. Um, but you're not measuring this medical effect that you'd want for generalization. Okay. Um, okay. Just give one other um, Here's an example um, where there's, it's a malaria prevention program, but some of the, some of the places have to, the, there's political pressures to, to treat, and so you add. Then you can, again, you can measure what's called the, the you can measure this impact, uh, the, uh, this intention to treat example, uh, or measure. We just, I think, let me just, uh, okay. Let me, um, wondering whether I should, let me, let me go back here and say, if, this, if the idea initially was to measure these blue, uh, you know, the, initially the, the blue circles were the ones that were supposed to be treated. I want to sort of talk about why you can't do what the apparently obvious thing of just comparing the guys who were treated to the ones who weren't. So if you, you've got this malaria prevention program, 40 villages are, are sampled, 20 were assigned to get the treatment the first year, 20 were assigned to be the comparison. But some of the comparison villages uh, object to this, and they say we want to be treated too. And the program manager says, look, we just have to go ahead and treat those. Okay? So if they implement it in, in if the, the program only gets implemented in 15 villages, and it, as well as in two villages that were supposed to be comparison. Okay? So what do you do to measure the impact of the program? Okay? So by the way, in the, the, the previous case uh, that I mentioned with the politician in Kenya, 
that school, the extra school, was neither treatment or comparison. So the, really, it, in that case, there was no problem because it was just out of the sample frame altogether, the extra school that got treated. Um, in this case, some of the comparison schools wind up getting treated. Okay? So how do you measure it? Well, here's the problem with what would happen if you, if you just um, if you just did the naive thing and said we're going to compare all the guys who actually got treated to the ones to the comparison schools, so we've got the the blue schools are the ones that were supposed to be treated, uh, that are in the sample. The the white schools are other villages. Okay, so T is the the original treatment group. So these are supposed the T's are supposed to be uh, be treated. The blues without T's in them are the, supposed to be the comparison. Okay, now the actual treatment are the green circles. Okay. So you can't, you can't compare the green circle villages with the blue dots. The green circles are the ones that were, um, are the ones that were actually treated, um, and the, the blue dots are the comparison. Why can't you make that comparison? Yeah. Either one. <laughs> They're not randomly assigned from the very beginning. And can you be, you know, can you be more specific about what your hypothesis might be on the, the it's difference? Right. Because somehow from the, from the schools or villages that were initially selected randomly. Exactly. Exactly. So the, um, so the guys that, um, the guys that fought to get the, so, so, the, we know that these guys who are, who are. Yeah, the guys who fought to get the treatment might differ from the ones that are initially selected randomly. They might have particularly capable leaders, for example, or influential leaders, right? And those influential leaders, this politician who managed to get the NGO program assigned to his area, he might have fought to get lots of other programs assigned there. So we don't know whether we're measuring the impact of this program, we're measuring the fact that they're, they're just able to get, use their political influence to get everything assigned there. And similarly, if you, if you leave out the... Um, um, so this is, this is basically just making the point, point that you said. Um, the, the other thing that you could think about doing is comparing the villages that were assigned to be a treatment group and actually got treated with the ones that were supposed to be a comparison group. So what's the problem with that? Attrition. Yeah, it's okay. Like it's kind of like attrition. Exactly. It's the same principle, which is you'd be leaving out a group that is the ones who were assigned to be treated but didn't wind up getting treated. Okay? Well, the ones who were assigned to be treated and nonetheless didn't get treated, those might be the ones, so for example, imagine there's violence in some of these areas and your workers, your field workers can't go there, so they never wind up getting treated. Um, well, the violence itself might have had an impact on, on development outcomes. So you may be measuring the impact of the violence or particularly bad leaders who, who despite being in the treatment group, still can't get their, their village treated. Um, so. Um, so that's not going to be a valid comparison either. Okay? Now, so sorry. So one thing. Okay. So one thing you can do is the intention to treat estimator. You can do that again in this case. So compare the initial twenty treatment villages with the initial twenty comparison villages, and then then you've got the ITT estimator. Now before I argued that the ITT estimator in the case of the deworming program. That arguably might be a very good measure of some things. You might not be able to do some other things with it, but it was still a useful measure. But in this case, suppose we want to actually understand what's the impact of the malaria treatment program. And we know that, you know, what's the impact of it if you're able to implement it? Well, the intention to treat estimator isn't really telling you that. It's telling you what's the effect of being assigned to the treatment, but it's not saying what's the effect of the program in the cases where you're able to implement it. So that's a problem, and that's where I'm, that's the, that's where I'm going to leave you with that uh, with that problem, and then Sean's going to tell you at least a solution to it. <laughs>